Well, let me welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. This is our focus on small businesses, really big business in America. My name is Kent Hughes. I'm currently a public policy scholar here. Formerly ran a program on America and the global economy. Still focus on innovation, innovation systems in the global economy and what that means for economic statecraft in the 21st century. For those of you who are new to the center, just sit, let me give you a word or two about how the center came to be and what our focus is. You, as you may know, Woodrow Wilson was the only American president who had a PhD. In his era, he was quite a prominent <coughs> political scientist with six or seven books to his credit. He went on to become president of Princeton, governor of New Jersey, and of course a two-term president. When Congress wanted to honor him, after some discussion and debate, they decided against another marble statue and against another monument on the mall and created what they termed a living memorial to Wilson. And the assignment they gave us was to bring together both sides of his life, the insightful scholar of policy and government and the policymaker and leader of government. So at the center, we have individual programs that literally cover the entire world and then some cross-cutting programs that look at key issues and how they play out in different regions around the world. Uh, over the course of the year, we'll have 150 people that come to do research here focused on public policy. They include academics. They may be former members of Congress, members of the press, really a range of people all focused on certain aspects of public policy. So we as part of this effort, and thanks to the Kauffman Foundation, we are focusing at one of the key questions for the American economy, which is the role, the strength, the importance, the health of small business, that it's widely, the, the press always reports that about half Americans work for small business and that most of the net new job creation comes out of those fast-growing small businesses often called uh, uh, gazelles. We're going to do a second look at small business and the support for small business on what some people call All, uh, all Saints Day. We're calling it All Entrepreneurs Day on November 1st. In the afternoon, starting at 2 o'clock, we'll look at the role of public-private partnerships in supporting small business. As I said, I want to thank the Kauffman Foundation and Dean Stangler, who made a big contribution to today's conference. He, Dane, is their uh, director of uh, policy and research and development. Well, for uh, many Americans, turning an idea into a tangible solution, creating and owning a small business is a big part of the American dream. Vannevar Bush, President Truman's science advisor, famously wrote about, quote, science, the endless frontier. I think the American dreaming of a small business sees America as an endless frontier of opportunity. Ideas, willingness to take a risk, an economy that supports new businesses, the presence of an able workforce, and often university research that has developed new products and processes are all important pieces of the entrepreneur's puzzle. But without financing, it's very hard to get started and even harder to grow. Jesse Unra, the longtime speaker of the California House, is now widely remembered for a single quote, money is the mother's milk of politics. It turns out money is often the mother's milk of many good things. And with an eye to financing, it is now my pleasure to introduce Jean Hewlett, the acting administrator of the Small Business Administration, she is new as the administrator, but brings a world of experience with her. I promised I would be brief, but particularly for those watching over the internet, I want to be sure they know a little bit about her. Prior to becoming the acting administrator, she was the associate administrator for the SBI's Office of Capital Access, kind of the theme of today's conference. She had 18 years in banking, including an international division at KeyBank. She was deputy director of the International Division of the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development and chair of the University of Southern Maine's Board of Visitors. So we have experience in banking, local government, the academic world, and at the SBA. We are very fortunate to have acting administrator Hewlett with us today. Madam Administrator, the floor is yours.
Thanking Kit for that warm introduction. Um, it's really an honor to be here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I am familiar with the uh, Wilson Center through my father, who is a diplomat and a regular attendee of events here. And um, I know that this is an organization of scholars and thought leaders. And I learned when we were having lunch that Senator Monaghan was critical in uh, negotiating the 30-year lease on this building. And um, my father served with Senator Monaghan when uh, uh, the senator was ambassador to India in the early 70s. And we like to say that the family serves. So I, I like to say I serve with Senator Monaghan. Um, it's an honor to be here today to discuss with you the current state of financing for small businesses and the important work that the U.S. Small Business Administration does to take care of America's 28 million small businesses and give them the tools and resources that they, they need to succeed. Over the past four years, our former administrator, Karen Mills, served as a tireless advocate for America's small businesses. Under her leadership, we accomplished tremendous things on behalf of America's entrepreneurs and as part of America's economic recovery. And during the last four years, as you heard from Kent, I've been at the SBA, I served as the New England Regional Administrator, and ran the Office of Capital Access. And now I'm honored to be the acting administrator. Because under President Obama, I have the privilege to serve a president who really gets small business. President Obama made small businesses a top priority from the day one. He has demonstrated that by elevating the administrator's position to cabinet level. And during the recent shutdown, he personally met with 10 businesses at the White House to hear exactly what the shutdown was doing to impact them. We also traveled together to Rockville to tour a factory there and hear from the business owners and the employees about the impact of uh, the shutdown. So as you can imagine, the shutdown was a challenging time for both the agency and the small businesses that we serve. According to independent economists, the government shutdown and threats of defaulting on America's debts unnecessarily damaged our economy. For small businesses, the shutdown meant that SBA loan applications could not be approved and small businesses had to put federal contracts on hold, have their payments delayed, resulting in cash flow problems, shift reductions, and even some furloughs. And the, the slowdown slowed our economy while actually increasing our deficit. When we returned at the SBA, we had approximately 400 million in loan applications pending for over 1,000 small businesses waiting for us to, to look at them. While some things may take time for us to get back up and running, the SBA's team of dedicated public servants are excited to be back to work, helping small businesses continue to do what they do best, be the engine of the American economy. Shutdown aside, I'm here today to talk about what the SBA is doing to increase access to capital for innovative small businesses across the country. I'd like to start first with the facts. As you heard, small businesses create nearly two out of every three net new private sector jobs, and more than half of Americans working today either own or work for a small business. And these 28 million small businesses are the foundation of our middle class. It's also a fact that the Great Recession was and has been particularly painful for small businesses. It hit small business employment particularly hard, accounting for roughly 60% of jobs that were lost. However, being resilient, small business owners are starting to get back to what they do best, leading America down a path to prosperity and economic recovery. And across the administration, we're focused on expanding access for op and opportunity for promising small businesses in more areas around the country. The SBA does that in critical ways. I like to call them our three C's and a D. The first C is counseling. Studies have shown that small businesses with a counselor experience increased sales and longevity and hire more workers. At the SBA, we have an extensive network of small business counselors that include 23 small business development centers in every state in the union with over 900 outreach centers and 1,000 women's business centers and over 12,000 SCORE volunteers. Our 68 district offices across the country are able to advise businesses on all the programs that we provide. And each year, our network reaches over 1 million entrepreneurs and small business owners. And the best part is that these programs are almost completely free. And many of these programs, such as our Emerging Leaders Program, are designed to help experienced business owners take their companies to the next level. The third C is contracting. The federal government, as you may know, is the largest procurer of goods and services in the world. 
and law requires that 23% of prime contracts go to small businesses. It's a win-win. The federal government gets to work with some of the most innovative small businesses, often direct, with direct access to the CEO and senior leadership, and small businesses get an important source of revenue. At the SBA, we connect small businesses with federal government's supply chain. This program provides small businesses with roughly $90 billion a year in federal contracting opportunities. The federal government continues to make real progress towards meeting their 23% goal of contracting dollars and has increased that percentage each year over the last three years. Also, I'm really pleased to say for the first time, the federal government met and exceeded the 3% statutory goal for providing service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses with contracts. We also exceeded our 5% goal for awarding contract dollars to small disadvantaged businesses, reaching 8% last year, the highest ever for this socioeconomic category. We'll be focusing on the third C, capital, in a little bit. But first, I want to highlight the fourth important role that the SBA plays, and that's disaster assistance. The SBA is here with direct loans for businesses of all sizes, homeowners, and renters when they've been impacted by a natural disaster. This is one of the most important functions that we have as an agency, and we've streamlined our disaster relief programs across the board. Our teams are still in the field right now in Colorado, helping individuals and businesses recover from the floods, and in Oklahoma from the tornadoes, and multiple other disasters across the country. And all of you may know that yesterday was the one year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. And when Sandy hit, we were there and we approved over $2.4 billion in loans to the Sandy impacted area for over 36,000 business and homeowners needing assistance to help repair, rebuild, and restart their local economy. So as you can see, the SBA has a diverse portfolio, but we may be best known for the third C, capital. Today, I want to talk to you about what the SBA is doing to increase access to capital and spur small business job creation. And most importantly, I'd like to focus on our loan programs and give you some specifics on what the SBA does to fill key market gaps that still exist today. First, let's start from where we were. Taking a look back to October 2008, the credit markets were frozen and good, healthy small businesses couldn't get the capital that they needed to not only sustain their businesses, but much less grow, expand, and hire. At the SBA, we had to do everything in our power just to jumpstart the credit markets. When President Obama took office, his top priority was the Recovery Act. This law gave us tools to help get capital flowing. Now, as many of you know, the SBA does not make direct loans, other than our disaster loan program. Rather, we partner with banks by providing loan guarantees and subordinated debt to uh, help banks make credit available when they couldn't make credit otherwise. After the Recovery Act passed, SBA was able to stem the decline in small business lending by eliminating fees and increasing our guarantees on SBA-supported loans. A year and a half later, we were able to pass the Small Business Jobs Act, which extended the programs under the Recovery Act and was one of the most important pieces of small business legislation in 10 years. One of the key things that the act did was increase SBA loan sizes to $5 million. It also allowed small business owners to use our 504 program to refinance commercial real estate and other fixed assets so that borrowers could lower their interest rates, access the equity in their properties, and reinvest it in their businesses. Together, these actions played a key role in helping increase points of access an opportunity for small businesses to obtain capital. The results were that SBA had a record years in 2011 and 2012, supporting over $30 billion in credit in each of those years, and as we know, fiscal year 2013 just ended and was our third highest year of SBA-supported lending, over $20, million, $20 billion for over 54,000 businesses. So combined, in the last three years, as we came out of this recession, the SBA supported 170,000 loans, totaling more than $90 billion for entrepreneurs that received credit when they wouldn't have otherwise. This is where I want to put the context of SBA lending programs in perspective. Since the recession began, U.S. commercial banks' loan portfolios have declined 18% 
for a total decline of $126 billion. And through 2012, loans under 100,000 have declined even more steeply. In the fourth quarter of 2012, more than five years after the mortgage crisis began, the level of commercial and industrial lending for loans a million dollars or less was nearly 22% below what it was in the second quarter of 2007. During that same period of time, when bank small business loan portfolios were declining in double digits, the SBA supported more than $60 billion in loans under a million dollars, supporting over 300,000 businesses in that market segment. With both lending and venture capital in decline, SBA stepped in to get critical resources into the hands of small businesses. So I always say, just think how much deeper the decline would have been had it not been for us. SBA was a critical piece of the recovery that's begun to take hold, and we're committed on building on that momentum as we see the economy improve. So where we're going. After losing more than 8 million jobs as a result of the financial crisis, the economy has added private sector jobs for 43 straight months, for a total of 7.6 million jobs during that period. And in 2012, the private sector alone added 2.2 million jobs and is on track to create nearly 2 million jobs in 2013. And, most importantly, America's small businesses are leading the way in this recovery. Small businesses account for 50% of private sector payroll and have created 63% of all net employment gains since the economy began creating jobs in 2010. And SBA is helping them do it. The study, a study last fall from the Center of Economic Studies called Do SBA Loans Create Jobs? found that the pov positive average effect of a loan recipient increased employment 25%. And for each $1 million in loan, creates 5.4 jobs for recipient firms. And more than half the employment gains occur in the year that the loan was approved or immediately afterwards, meaning, meaning that these loans provide speedy, steady, and sustained employment benefits. But bes aside from these key points, there are still some gaps. Data shows that small dollar loans under 250000 are still down with a decrease of about $60 billion since 2008. And unfortunately, SBA lending has also followed this trend. During the pre-recession heyday, 80% of SBA loans were under $150,000, originated largely by the top 10 banks in the country. Today, the number of SBA loans under $150,000 is down by 50%. Now, we know that these loans are particularly important to underserved communities. And that's why we've implemented concrete measures to help get more capital into the hands of the smallest business owners than ever before. To help fill these market gaps, SBA streamlined and simplified its programs and open, opened them up to more lending institutions, bringing 1,000 community banks back to SBA lending since 2007. And we also, worked with our largest lenders and obtained a commitment from the 13th largest, 13 largest banks to increase small business lending by $20 billion over a three-year period. These banks are still on, on track to make their goal and after two years have uh, provided roughly an increase of $17 billion. We significantly reduced the paperwork in our Small Loan Advantage program, a key initiative to expand access to 7A products for loans under $350,000 and expanding our pool of lenders. I'm really pleased to report that when we made the changes in our program, because we, we talked about public-private partnerships being so important, again, we don't make direct loans, we guarantee loans, so we have to partner with our lenders, but if our programs are cumbersome and hard to use, our, par our lending partners don't take advantage of them. So we made changes that have resulted in a 300% increase in our Small Loan Advantage program and over a 700% increase in the number of lenders participating. This success is driving new policies for all of our SBA 7A loans under $350,000 that will become effective January 1st. Because we know when we make our programs easier to use and reduce our lenders' transaction costs, more will participate. Additionally, we established the Community Advantage Program 
to provide R7A guarantee to nonprofit mission-based lenders to provide loans under $250,000 to the communities that they serve. These nonprofit mission-based lenders have deep reaches into the underserved communities that the credit crisis have left behind. And I'm also pleased to announce that we have another tool in our kit to provide increased lending to the smallest borrowers and underserved communities by lowering our fees on our 7A loan program for all loans under $150,000, making it easier to get credit to the underserved communities and lower the transaction costs for both the borrower and the lender. So in addition to these programs, the SBA have, has other tools to help fill credit gaps, including our 504 program I referenced earlier and our working capital cap line. SBA's 504 program provides small businesses with long-term fixed rate financing to acquire real estate and fixed assets for expansion or modernization and project finance. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, the JOBS Act provided tools for our 504 program to allow for refinancing of real estate to lower interest rates and improve cash flow and reinvest into their business. Unfortunately, the refinance program expired in September of 2012 just when the demand was picking up and our lenders and small businesses were being, be, becoming aware of this opportunity. While we were able to provide 2,700 refinance loans under the program for a total of $2.5 billion, on the last day of the program, we were not able to process an additional 405 loans totaling half a billion dollars when the program expired. So we know there's a demand to reauthorize this program which is why the President has included it in his 2014 budget. We also revamped our working capital cap line, uh, lines of credit program, which is now experiencing loan volumes up 300% in dollar value and 500% in number. Again, demonstrating that when we work with our lending partners to streamline and simplify our programs, we're able to provide solutions that meet market gaps. In the two years since we simplified that program, the SBA has guaranteed almost as many working capital lines of credit under the cap line program as we did in the 15 years prior combined. And this is important to our economic recovery because these credit products are provided, two thirds of them are provided to manufacturers, construction and utility trades, driving the economic recovery. Finally, America is a nation of innovators and entrepreneurs which is why the SBA also supports equity financing through our Small Business Investment Company, or SBIC, program. This program helps innovative entrepreneurs across the country turn their ideas into reality. These are those gazelles that Kent was talking about. The SBA oversees more than 300 SBA licensed funds with over 18 billion in capital, combining almost 9 billion in SBA leveraged <coughs> commitments with $9.4 billion from private sector investors. We had our fourth consecutive record-breaking year in 2013, providing over 850 small businesses with approximately $3.3 billion in growth capital, a 10% increase over the prior year, 2012, and a 105% increase over 2010. So in conclusion, the SBA continues to be well positioned to assist small businesses as they seek opportunities to grow, hire, and diversify in a growing economy. And in partnership with our lenders, entrepreneurs, and we can reach businesses in more areas and industries across the country that will have access and opportunity that they need to drive their nation's economy and increase our global competitiveness. President Obama has said, the story of America's success is written by America's entrepreneurs, men and women who took a chance on a dream and they turned that dream into a business and somehow changed the world. And with the help of the SBA, I'm proud to say that America's small businesses are poised to do just that. Thank you again for welcoming me here today. It's an honor and I'm happy to answer your questions. We, as you heard, the administrators graciously agreed to take some questions, and before we do that, I think 
in reflecting on the three C's and the D, I think we have to give the administrator an A+. Plus. Thank you. <laughs> so well, if, if you could wait, to just uh, I'll recognize you and then wait for a microphone and then please identify yourself. Is a microphone coming there? Uh, first, congratulations on your new position. Thank you. Um, my name is Warren Edwards. I work, I, I'm the founder and the president of the McPherson Square Business Council, which is the DC chapter of the Biz Referral Network. And two years ago, a good friend of mine, uh, Chris Bromfield, and I had a major network focused on government contracting and government doing business with the federal government. Basically, we had David Henson there, who uh, represents MBE. And after the event, he invited me to the uh, Department of Commerce to meet with Mr. Guzman. And I brought a proposal to Mr. Guzman in terms of how to really enhance and grow small business. I'm a former banker myself, so I kind of know about lending and all that. We refer that to as recovering lenders. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So Mr. Guzman, uh, in turn, shared information with Mr. Henson. And Mr. Henson, as I was driving along uh, to another state to visit my, my family, uh, introduced Ms., uh, the former uh, administrator, Ms. Hill, Ms. Mills, and she indicated that at that time that they were going to roll out one of my proposals, which was to um, provide a net 15 payoff instead of a net 30 to government contractors uh, to prime. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, which I said, like, Eureka, they, they listen. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person who made that suggestion. It was probably one of those moments where maybe 15 to 20 people said, you know, if you make money available for, for the work that's been done, if you make it soon enough, they, they have less of a need to go to a bank and get a line of credit to make payroll, which is everybody's nightmare, mm -hmm. okay? So that was great, but my ask is, is, to the next step, is there a way that we can ensure that the subprimes who really do the work mm -hmm can get their money on a net maybe 17. Once the primes get their net 15, can they pass it on and pay uh, the subprimes because it, it's not applicable to them as of this moment? Um, you know, I have to, to say that I'd look into that. I think the quick pay program that you're talking about, you know, we can direct our, our federal agencies to pay within a certain time frame. We can't direct a business to pay another business in a certain time frame. That's we can right. encourage, and it's one of the things that we are actually in regular dialogue with, not just our prime contractors and government contracting, but with Americans' large corporations as well that have a supply chain to America's small businesses across the country. And it is a regular ask that we make. Um, so while we can't dictate it, we can encourage it, we can use the bully pulpit, which I, I believe uh, we do and the President has done. Um, one of the things we can do that, if you're not aware of, is with our cap line changes, one of those cap lines is our contract cap line. So uh, you can get a line of credit if you're the prime contractor and use that, con that federal contract as your collateral to get the working capital that you need, which may enable you to have the cash flow to support your primes. So that's one of the tools that we have uh, available to you as well. And I wanna, I wanna thank you for bringing up the uh, line of credit uh, piece because so many small businesses don't necessarily need a lump sum. Uh, it, it's similar to someone buying, using their equity in their home. They don't need 50000 to repair a roof. They might just need twenty, but they get 50000 in a lump, and then they're stuck with that, uh, with that burden. Exactly. So a line of credit is critical, especially in making payroll, which is what m a lot of my members mention is what keeps them up at night. Absolutely. The two financing programs, and one I didn't mention, the, 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 the line of credit for contractors, our contract cap line, but we also provide um, government-backed surety bonds. So as you know, as a contractor, you have to have, for any federal contract, you have, a, have to have a surety bond for any contract over $150,000. For a lot of small businesses, they may not have the financial wherewithal to get that kind of bonding, and the SBA can guarantee that surety bond so you can grow into a larger federal contractor, as well as contracts with municipalities and state government, et cetera. <coughs> That's the gentleman here. We'll get a microphone to you in just a second. Thank you for your comments. Uh, my name is Fred Stahl. I'm a former uh, executive with the Boeing Company. Uh, 
And uh, I wanted to uh, just call attention to a word that we use a lot here, and that is entrepreneur. Um, unfortunately, Karl Marx hung the name capitalism on our economic system. Uh, Say invented and identified the entrepreneur several decades before Karl Marx wrote. He did not mention it in his book, Das Kapital, because he could not. The entrepreneur would have a prior claim on the surplus of an enterprise that he wanted to assign to the proletariat. So it seems to me the reality is that capitalists are suppliers to the entrepreneurs. And shouldn't we now change the name of our system to entrepreneurialism? I think that's very unique. And i uh, be happy to suggest that to my colleagues in the administration. I don't know how far that would go. Um, but, I, but I do appreciate your perspective. And, and since you are from Boeing, I do want to mention that one of the primary uh, initiatives for our economic growth also is increasing our exports. And Boeing, as you know, is a huge exporter. And the president has uh, his national export initiative to uh, double our exports in five years. And uh, the chairman and CEO of Boeing Corporation is chairman of the president's export council. And uh, they're doing great work. So thank you. Do you find yourself working with a lot of small businesses that are focused on the export market? We do, and you know it's interesting because I, w as you know, I was a lender, um, and at the sort of end of my career, the portfolio I had, I would say every business in my portfolio did exporting. They don't self-identify themselves as exporters. They identify themselves as businesses, and exporting is one of the things that they do. So um, I'm of the belief that you have to treat exporters just as another exporting as another part of your your sales strategy. But increasingly, you'll see small business exporters learning about what they need to do. We have some great tools on our SBA website. We partner with the Department of Commerce um, to make sure that small businesses have the resources that larger companies have in order to be successful in exporting. Lady there. Hi, I'm Jess Brooks from the Science Technology Policy Institute. Um, many new companies are based on, or innovative new companies are based on intangible ideas. So I'm wondering if the SBA um, has started to look into how to make loans based on intangible assets and any programs in that area. It's a, it's a topic, obviously, that you know, we, we discuss a lot. Um, the, the thing about SBA loans is that the SBA, one of the major reasons a bank would use an SBA guarantee is for collateral shortfall. So when you have an intangible asset, by de facto you have collateral shortfall. So we do already support startup businesses and businesses that have collateral shortfalls. The challenge is that the bank needs to want to make that loan and they're going to be looking at the revenue stream to repay the loan. So the question is, there are many small businesses that have intangible assets that are part of the overall collateral and they get an SBA guarantee, but we have a challenge with pre-revenue, high tech, high startup, high growth companies versus companies that already have a revenue stream. That's the challenge we're trying to meet. And that's where equity really comes into play. And our SBIC program um, is really the tool that uh, most entrepreneurs would take advantage of. <coughs> You mentioned the gazelle. I guess I started the gazelle conversation. And it is something that everyone dreams about. Who's going to be the next Google, the next Apple, the next Hewlett Packard, and so forth? And I wondered if in, with limited resources, is there a way or do you ever favor companies that appear to be in that high-tech space? Again, uh, the SBA is a public-private partnership, so we don't make that loan. The bank makes that loan. We guarantee it. Um, so it really is on the strength of the business package that the bank has presented to us. So we may not see that and differentiate between um, you know, the high-tech firm or the mom-and-pop shop. Um, I would say that, on, again, on the SBIC program, because that's where you're talking about uh, equity financing, mezzanine financing, um, uh, that kind of mix of debt and equity, long-term patient capital. Uh, we partner with VC funds. We provide the debenture that matches with the, the venture firms, but we have to license them. 
So we do license uh, firms that uh, meet certain market niches. We, we are anxious to make sure we have geographic diversity in terms of our SBICs as well as industry diversity. Uh, we have a high impact fund for high growth companies. We have emerging markets funds and that kind of thing. So uh, we do um, have an ability to control the licensing of a fund, but we don't control which firm gets the money. I was the Wilson Center, of course, carrying on the heritage of Woodrow Wilson is often globally focused. And I wondered if other countries are attempting to emulate your success. Do you find foreign governments knocking on your door saying, how did you do it? How should we do it? Very much so. Um, we have an international division at the SBA in addition to providing um, export counseling and our export finance tools. One of the major things that they do is work on the international visitors program because we have so many countries that do come to us to want to learn what we do. We worked closely in the past year with the United Kingdom and um, uh, Mexico and, and some other developing countries that have come to us to, uh, to really learn how do we provide this kind of capital. Which I'm sort of monopolizing the questions, which I've got a long list of questions I threatened the administrator <laughs> with before the, before the talk. Is there any last question there? Let me just ask There's one. A oh, gentleman in the back. Yeah, please, thank you. Thank you. I'm Gal. I'm uh, the owner of a startup company, um, Insights. Uh, we develop digital consulting platforms that extract professional advice from crowds. I'm interested to know what doesn't work. Um, you have a long experience in this field. Um, what did you find is the least uh, effective things? in order to help um, small businesses. W we all know what works. Um, you gave um, a list and it, it sounds promising, but I wonder what, are the, what is the advice on what should we change? I mean, which areas we should focus that actually bring no outcomes, no results? On the government program side? Yes. Um, I would have to go back a little bit in history. Our, our uh, SBIC program did uh, make direct investments, I believe, back long ago. And uh, it was during the run-up of the high-tech boom before another bubble burst. Um, and uh, that program wasn't successful. I think it was called the, uh, Andy probably remembers the preferred, um, it wasn't our debenture program. It was uh, more of a direct in participating securities program. Thank you. That wasn't a big success because, you know, it's very dynamic. The, that's a dynamic industry, and, and uh, I'll just frankly say government maybe isn't as dynamic sometimes as the private sector. Yeah. <laughs> well, if there, are, uh, if there are no more questions, please join me in a round of applause for just a <laughs> terrific presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. I certainly hope to have you back. I just want to say one thing, because I threatened my colleagues with this. Um, only because Pe Kent gave me, gave me an A-plus on my speech. My mother was my speech teacher in high school, and she did not give me an A-plus. And it was, a, <laughs> it was a searing lesson, so I've always worked hard to overcome that. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day. I if I could invite the panel to join me up on the podium here. Well, I'm now pleased to welcome really an outstanding panel, and I will introduce them to you briefly. And they were so outstanding that the only diplomatic approach I could settle on is introducing them alphabetically. 
so I want to start with uh, Giovanni uh, Corotolo, who's the vice president. Thank you. Giovanni, you are? Vice president of small business policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And before he came to the chamber, he had over 25 years of starting and owning a whole variety of small businesses, restaurants, a land development firm, software installation and service company, a vending company, and actually at one point served on the board of directors of the National Restaurant Association. Really an enormous array of experience, and he is an engineer from the University of Maryland, and dangerously he has also studied law and business. <laughs> Uh, Robert Dilger, my uh, immediate to your immediate right there, is a senior specialist in American national government, the Congressional Research Service. So when you wonder who it is that's putting these key ideas in the congressional hearings, it's usually someone like uh, Robert Dilger. Before becoming a senior specialist, which is quite a, a august position at the uh, Congressional Research Service, uh, Bob served as an assistant director of the Government and Finance Division. And prior to CRS, he was the founding director of the Institute of Public Affairs, a professor of political science at West Virginia University, the author or co-author of eight books and numerous articles. He has a BA in political science and PhD from Brandeis, is that right? Next, I'm uh, delighted to introduce Sean Mallon. I think every time he turns around, he starts another entrepreneurial business. He uh, currently is the senior investment director of the Center for Innovative Technology. He joined CIT in 2011 uh, as the senior investment director. Gap Funds focuses on early stage companies that are committed to growth. That sounds like those gazelles we were referencing earlier. He serves on the board of several growth companies. He's the founder and CEO of Good Clean Fund Ventures uh, this is sort of grand pleasure auto rather than grand theft auto, I guess. <laughs> he has been a senior uh, officer at a series of innovative firms, Simplexity, Infonic, Q-Mobile, Centauri. He was a principal at Mid-Atlantic Venture Funds. He has an AB from Princeton, which of course would make Woodrow Wilson happy, <laughs> and an MBA from Wharton. And last but certainly not least is uh, Shelley Mewey Lipnick. Have I pronounced that correctly? You have. Wow. <laughs> She's the Senior Director of Tax and Financial Services Policy for the Biotechnology Industry Organization, whose acronym, of course, is BIO. Very clever move. <laughs> she has worked with several members of Congress on the Therapeutic Discovery Tax Credit, or the SEC on the question of short selling, and the Financial Advisory, uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board on Revenue Recognition. Uh, prior to bio she, bio, she worked as an employee benef on the employee benefits at Hewlett Associates and at the Department of Labor and Title I of ERISA, which is a, a, a law that you hear a lot about. She has a Master's of Law in Tax from Georgetown, a JD from Syracuse, College of Law and a BNS of International Business from the University of Maryland. Again, one of those dangerous combinations <laughs> of law and business. Well, as a country boy from Oregon myself, being surrounded by such a well-educated and expert group, it's more than a little intimidating. But it is just what we need to explore the world of finance for entrepreneurs and small business. I've asked the panelists to keep their remarks to, say, seven or ten minutes so that there will be plenty of time for your questions. And, I'm gonna, and again, falling back on diplomatic niceties, I'm going to ask the panelists to speak in alphabetical order. So Giovanni. Ah, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and this is a, a great opportunity. And I guess we should start with a quote from Wilson since we're, we're in his center. And Wilson said, uh, we grow great by dreams. And I think that's the mantra of small businesses. Uh, certainly turning those dreams into actual uh, products and businesses uh, requires capital. And that's where we really uh, uh, where we're focused today. Uh, certainly, as we look over the market, and I'm a market-based person, I like uh, the private sector to handle most uh, areas, we, we see a lot of gaps. And that's why we have SBA being so successful. And I'd like to just point out, and I guess we can start the conversation, to point out a few of those gaps, and hopefully we can build on some of the gaps as we uh, go through the panelists. But uh, one gap that I notice when I was in business is the disparity between 
the revenue generation of an asset, the time that asset will produce revenues when you purchase it, and the willingness of a financial institution to um, uh, fund it. So for instance, typical a building. Well, uh, if you buy a building today, you have uh, uh, commercial banks that are willing to lend money. Generally speaking, they will amortize it over a number of years, but they'll have a five-year call on that asset. Same thing with fixed assets and machinery. You'll have uh, uh, certain revenue streams. Uh, maybe you're buying a machine or an air conditioning based on efficiency. Uh, uh, you're making your operation more efficient. Uh, or you're, you're going into different markets. Maybe it's something that's uh, going to make you more productive. Uh, uh, that will produce a revenue stream over a course of time. Yet you have banks that are unwilling or need to mitigate some risk in order to uh, provide the financing for that. So that's one disparity. Uh, SBA has been helpful in the sense that uh, they will have a guarantee in their 504 and their 704. Uh, 7A programs such that they're able to lock in those rates through their gar guarantees over a number of uh, years so you can have a 20-year uh, mortgage on a building uh, and, and lock in your, your, your security and certainty. Uh, another area, a, a gap that uh, I find businesses expressing, especially small businesses, is in financial uh, international sales, uh, and that's something uh, certainly we have XMM Bank, but we, we also have other gaps where uh, banks will or, or are afraid to lend uh, when, it, uh, when it has to do with international sales. But there are, in all fairness, there are certain banks that will do that lending. Uh, a third gap that I've identified and, and have seen uh, especially recently is the, uh, in the wake of the financial downturn, uh, the current efforts to regulate or reduce risk within financial institutions. Uh, and that has some good and bad. Obviously, we need to uh, reassess risk. Uh, uh, our, our financial institutions are a bedrock of our economy. We cannot have go through what we went through in 2007. Uh, it's just not worth it. But that has, in, in our attempt to regulate our financial institutions, it has had a ripple effect in the sense that uh, it has accelerated what has occurred since the 1990s. In 1990, you had 15,000 banking banks, uh, banking institutions. Today, you have less than 7,000. So you have uh, uh, a, a growing, diminishing number uh, or a diminishing number of uh, financial institutions for people to go to to lend. Uh, and they're becoming much larger. Uh, what is happening is through the financial regulations being imposed, uh, the uh, uh, requirements for liquidity, uh, Basel III, you can, go in, you can go very deeply into what's being done. Uh, too big to fail has become too small to operate for smaller banks. And you see a lot of uh, uh, banking institutions um, uh, uh, taking over other banks. Uh, that has uh, provided banking institutions with the incentive of becoming less riskier. Uh, and it's also taking, taken one of the main, ass uh, main a assets that small businesses have, and there are also four C's that banks use to, to lend money, and collateral and uh, uh, capacity and the, uh, the ability to pay back uh, the loan, uh, but one C that <coughs> banks have is or small businesses have is character. And the bigger the bank, the less a small business is able to <coughs> use that asset in order to get the loan. If you have a small community bank that's across the street, generally speaking, that banker knows that small business owner and is able to um, uh, use the or know the character of that person and take on a little more risk because uh, the character of the person will actually mitigate some of the risk. So this is another gap that we see emerging, uh, another problem as we move forward, and, and obviously it's not a problem now, it's being made up by SBA lending. But then there's the fourth gap that we see, and I think a lot of our panelists here will probably build on it. And to set this up, if, if you're an 18-year-old, 
with no visible means of, uh, uh, of uh, paying anything back. You can, you can get right now a $100,000 loan, or up to $100,000, uh, to expand your intellectual capacity. But you can't borrow $1 to monetize that intellectual capacity. And, and not that we should uh, have open uh, uh, roads for, for people graduating from college to get loans, but it really shows the problem now that we have when you have, when we move toward a knowledge-based society. So, uh, and I think a question was raised earlier uh, with the acting administrator uh, Hewlett, uh, how do you finance intellectual property? Uh, it, it's a very difficult process and there's gaps in that. Obviously, when you start a business and you're, say, in a, uh, uh, it's requiring a, a computer or a website, uh, that's easy to get. And you certainly want to use friends and family. Uh, angel investors are, are, are there. I mean, there's a lot of people that uh, if you can convince that you have a viable product that they will invest money, and that's patient money to a certain degree. But then you get to the point where you're wanting to grow, and, and, and that's an area that's uh, very important uh, because a fastly growing company, and a lot of people don't realize this, when you're fastly growing, when you have, when you're in the world of IT and you're fast, uh, and you're growing your business and you're to that point where you need to take on a lot of employees, you need to do it quickly. I've talked to a lot of people in the IT world or in the intellectual property where you're, where you're really selling intellectual property or, or trying to finance intellectual property, and they're spending more time trying to come up with financing rather than developing that property. And that's basically the conundrum we have uh, as a society because we're really growing into a knowledge-based society. Uh, the SBIC program is an excellent program. We, we certainly endorse it at the chamber, but uh, uh, this is something that we really have to explore and some of the gaps involved in that. Those are four gaps that I point out. I'm sure my colleagues may have more, but uh, let me go from there and just pass the baton, Ken. Thank you very much, Bob. I right. think you're next. Yes. We need some help with the uh, slides. Okay. For those of you who, aren't f who are not familiar with the Congressional Research Service, we are a nonpartisan source of authoritative, confidential information and analysis to members of Congress and their staffs. We work exclusively for the legislative branch. And as part of that, anything I say today is my opinion, mine and own, and not of the Library of Congress. Uh, but our primary source is to elevate the level of conversation uh, on Capitol Hill so that people are dealing with objective information that they can trust. And as part of this, Kent asked me if I might give, uh, if I were uh, having a briefing with a member of Congress and they were to ask me what's the nature of small business lending environment, what would I tell them? The first thing I would tell them is there's not a lot of fabulous, methodologically sound data to begin the conversation with. For example, we don't know how many people go to get a small business loan as defined by the Small Business Administration and are either accepted or are rejected. We do have data on lending from the Small Business Administration in terms of what their loan volumes are, but we don't know a lot about what it is the individual experiences across the country of all those folks are. So it's really hard to get an objective nature of the scope and depth of the supply and demand of small business loans. But we do have some proxies, which provides you at least a starting point for a common conversation, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or whatever your ideological views are, so at least you can come some some common understanding of what the trends are. The end of the story is the trend is the small business lending environment is improving. But whether or not it's strong enough based a little bit on your values uh, judgments, and also it varies a little bit from region to region in the country, but overall, the three indicators I'm about to show you in terms of slides are all indicating that things are getting better. Some people will say it's good enough. Other people say we have more work to do, and that's where it gets fun on Capitol Hill. So if I have this correct, let's see. This is first a survey from the Federal Reserve Board of senior loan officers, which gives a sense of their view of what the supply and demand of small business loans are. And I've used this data going back to uh, the year 2000. And as you can see, uh, if you look at where the, the, the big recession was in uh, 2009 and 2010, you had the worst of both possible worlds. 
you had senior loan officers saying we're tightening the supply standards, which that's the line going up. You had sm uh, they're also saying the demand that we're getting is going down. So at one time you had the, 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 the lending environment was tightening on both ends. Demand was down, supply was down, even though the chart shows going up. See what I'm suggesting? And as a result, that was the worst of all possible worlds. But as you can see, it's not the first time that we've had this kind of situation. We tend to go through periods of where it's a more robust small business lending environment and periods where it's much more difficult, according to senior loan officers uh, surveyed by the Federal Reserve Board. And as you can see, we're in the process. Uh, things are getting a little bit better. Demand's coming up. Loan officers are saying demand's improving. We're getting more business at the door. And we're loosening our standards a little bit. So we're not back at the period of robustness of 2004, 2005, uh, and the beginning of 2006, but it looks like we're getting there. So progress is being made, at least from the view of senior loan officers. The next uh, statistic, which is actually used by the Small Business Administration, is an imperfect s statistic, but it's at least something quantifiable. It's done by uh, the FDIC, the Federal Deposit uh, Insurance Corporation. Um, they survey the, uh, all FDIC uh, uh, institutions, and they give an, an, an indication using $1 million or less as a proxy for small business loans. Again, it's not loans to small businesses as defined by the SBA, and even the SBA loans now go up to $5 million, so it's an imperfect measure. But you get a sense of what's the outstanding loan balance. Now, this is a combination of inflow and outflow. So it, you could say if things are really robust, wouldn't it be going up or could it be coming down because everybody's paying it off? But at least you get a sense of what it is prior in previous years. And the SBA has indicated that when it's going up, they feel that that's a sign of an improving uh, marketplace. And when it's coming down, it's a sign of a challenging marketplace for small business loans. And as you can see, we came down in the period of 2009, 2010, and 11, and we've kind of hit a bottom, hopefully. Uh, and we get a sense of leveling out in terms of what the overall portfolio of from the FDIC lending institutions of smaller loans. And so this is yet another indication that maybe it's not as robust as it's always been, but things uh, it's at least a positive development. It's not shrinking anymore, and it looks like it may be on the way up. Um, also, the Federal Reserve Board does a survey of commercial banks. Now, that's not an entire universe of where people get capital from. There are savings and loan institutions and credit uh, unions which give about 10 or 15 percent of what the commercial banks do, and we're not even discussing credit cards or um, venture capitalists, which are another source of income. But at least this is concrete data that we can look at over time that's collected by the Federal Reserve Board about what's going on in terms of lending. This chart is actually one of uh, total lending. Uh, and it's on a quarterly basis. You may recall that uh, quite often people will cite the second quarter. You see how there's a spike there? Um, so you have to be careful when uh, what data you're using from. So somebody will say from the second quarter of such and such or the third quarter of such and such, you can kind of pick the quarter, whichever makes it feel best. Uh, but you get a sense of what happened here. Um, kind of a general up and then, boo, the recession hit, down it comes, and now we're generally increasing again. Um, so I again, it's kind of another Things are getting a little bit better. Um, now, what about small business loans? Surprisingly, it's been less volatile than overall lending uh, to, lar to all businesses. Uh, but still, there's some volatility, as you can see. And then you can, you can make this chart look different based on what the scale is. So I can make it look really like there's no volatility. This is kind of a, my judgment of what's a fair call in terms of how what you put it on the scaling. But as you can see, during the recession, it kind of dropped down from commercial banks, and it's been slowly on the rise since. And then as a cumulative over the period, uh, annualizing that data, you can see that we have now reached the period prior to the recession. And based on projections after three quarters of this year projected out to four, it looks like we're going to actually exceed where we were prior to the uh, uh, recession. Now, that's just commercial banks. Uh, it kind of reflects a little bit what those senior loan officers were telling us, that things were getting better. Um, but what this doesn't tell us is how many people are actually still being turned away. Because what we don't have is a common denominator of what that overall market is. What, were we powerful and, and robust in 2005 or 2006? Or were we weak? 
all we know is that the data suggests that when you compare before the recession to now, there definitely was a major break uh, in the downward session for the uh, small business lending environment during the recession and immediately after because there's always this period of time that occurs. It's like a lag. Everybody's noticed that after every recession with small business lending. There always seems to be an extension. Same thing with uh, state and local government finances. Uh, it, there's a prolonged lag. Now that we're out a couple years from the recession, things are looking better. But that doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. It doesn't mean that we're done, if you will. We just sit back and let it go and it'll fix itself kind of thing. It means that we're in better shape than we were a few years ago and now it's time to really look at all of our programs to see which are the most efficient, particularly given the uh, fiscal environment that we're in, uh, that are giving us the best, from a congressional perspective, the most efficiency and the best return on the investment. Uh, and that's what we do at CRS. We help them uh, look at all of the major programs. That's what I do. I've done for five years as I've done analyses of every, all of the SBA programs. And then as, uh, members of Congress come and ask, well, how's it doing? What was it intended to do? Uh, and are we getting our money's worth? And we try to give them as much information as possible. Um, with that, I will stop. But I wanted to give you a framework for understanding that the small business lending environment evolves over time. And there are times when it's clearly worse. There are times when it's clearly getting better. Um, but we're all struggling on Capitol Hill to figure out a common uh, discussion so that when we have debates about what to do, uh, we're dealing with uh, the same kind of information and that it's valid and reliable and it's not based on anecdotal evidence. Thank you, Bob, very much. John. Is that, can you pass that clicker down? Yes. So I'm going to kick it off by saying, going from the reliable quantitative presenter to the completely anecdotal presenter uh, here, and, and uh, so I'm I'm a, a very early stage uh, investor. Um, I'm by early stage. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of define that I think a little bit. Actually, what I, what I wanted to do, and you all won't be able to see this too well, but I was thinking as I was listening. So I take notes during meetings on my iPad. And I'm not sure what this is I'm looking at here. Um, so here down the left-hand side are all the companies that I've met with, startups, rank startups I've met with in the last 30 days or so. So, and that's just in the state of Virginia. Um, let me start by, by um, seeing anything. So I'm with the uh, Center for Innovative Technology. We're based out of Herndon, Virginia. Um, we are... Uh, an independent 501c3 nonprofit, um, and we get um, we do a number of things. But my group within it is called the CIT Gap Funds, and as you can, as the name suggests, Gap, we target a funding gap uh, that we believe exists in the very early stages of of the funding need. Um, so we are um, funding gap for Virginia based. So we're funded by Richmond, um, and we have counterparts in most states across the country, so I wanted to make, make that clear. It doesn't, you don't need to move to Virginia to benefit from something like this, though we'd love to have you um, as entrepreneurs. Um, early stage, I will define that a little bit better, but really, I'll give you a sense. Early stage in my world is one or two or three people walking into my office with an idea. And usually at that point I say, you know what, why don't you guys come back when you have at least something that you've, that you've screwed together either whether it's software or something like that, uh, we don't necessarily need to see revenue, but we want to see a product that they can show to wh the folks that they believe will be their customers, and those customers will go, ooh, and ah, and that's great. Build that a little bit more and we'll buy it, because when we look to make an investment, those are the people that we want to call and say, well, do you know these guys for real? And do you really like what they're working on? Um, so um, the, the key thing, too, I think to take away from this, we've been talking about lending and the SBA and things like that, is there's really, my world is, is uh, starts at, at with very, very young companies, but we only invest in about 2 to 3% of the companies that we meet with. What we're looking for are those, you can call them gazelles or hyper-growth opportunities or a number of different ways to look at it, but most businesses in America and most businesses around the world are not venturable businesses. 
they're good old fashioned, either good or not good, but that's, that's not relevant, but they're not gonna be in the kind of the hyper growth variety. They're gonna be, you know, you set it up now, you make some initial sales, you plow those sales back into expansion and buying more inventory and hiring people and things like that, and you're gonna grow at, you know, ten, between 10% 10 a year and 100% a year, and you're gonna feel good about that, hopefully over time. What we're looking for are those opportunities that are truly, you know, run by outstanding entrepreneurs who have an outstanding idea and who are going after, you know, a, either a very large or what we believe is going to be a very quickly growing market opportunity and who have a, a special that really can turn into the Google or to the Yahoo or, or the Apple or the HP um, over the course of time. So that's really why we say no most of the time. But part of our mission as a publicly funded, taxpayer funded entity is that we really tr do try to be coaches as well to those entrepreneurs and say, we don't think we can bring you through the CIT process. But you know, you should, you know, and I'm, I'm an ex-operating guy and had some startups and things like that, so we really try to move them along. Um, and a little bit of an anecdote, I'm not really following my slides, but um, <laughs> I had uh, kind of cleaning out my emails yesterday, I ran across an email from a young entrepreneur He's actually not as young as he looks. He came into our meeting with a baseball cap turned backward, and he's about 35, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and uh, so he, he had, we, I had brought him through our investment committee, and the investment committee was kind of soft on the opportunity. You know, like, let's, let's kind of wait and see what's going on. I like the guys, but you know, the baseball cap thing, we're not sure about that. And uh, so I reached out to him yesterday when I saw the email. I said, hey, uh, Vincent, we should, you know, we, we should meet up, see how things are going. I said, how's it going, first of all? And he wrote back to me this morning. He said, well, we've gone from three people to 13 people in the last six months. And business is great, and we've got things going. So this is an interesting example, right? So this is someone that we turned away, and we liked him, right? But it wasn't, didn't quite hit that threshold of activity. We see a lot of companies coming through. And uh, so he just kind of said, you know what? Fine, I'm going to make it happen. He had some friends and family that had invested in the business. They had, you know, really scrappy uh, software guys that just said, you know, we don't, we don't need a lot of money to build it. These days, you can build a software prototype for virtually nothing. You got Amazon Web Services, so you don't need to buy hardware. You got all these different things that you can leverage to make life very inexpensive in the early going. And uh, so they're just, they just kind of, they got knows. They talked to a bunch of investors. Everyone said, no, wait, you know, later. And they just said, all right, we've got customers. Let's just go get more customers and find new ways to get them. So there's all kinds, there's, there's, in my life, and I've been, I've been running around doing this kind of thing for about 25 years, there's never been a better time to start a business, particularly, I would argue, in the software and, you know, enterprise software, not so much consumer software, because that's a, that's a different game altogether, but it's a great time to start a business, despite lack of funding, uh, you know, Parents, uncles, relatives, friends, they're always a good source of capital, and you, it goes a lot further now than it, it ever did. So let me just tell you a little bit more about, um, about CIT before I get too far away, before I run out of time. Um, there we go. So yeah, so we're, we're an independent uh, nonprofit. We get money from appropriated to us from the state of Virginia, so we, as a result, only invest in Virginia-based companies. Uh, but Maryland has a similar thing. Um, D.C. not so much, but they're working on it. Um, so you can see there we write relatively small checks, fifty to uh, to two hundred thousand uh, dollars. Our model is really to leverage, as you can see on the fourth bullet, fifth bullet point, um, leverage a lot of due diligence that we do, that is intention to make angel investors and other early stage and not quite venture guys. This tends to be pre venture. Um, to get them off the fence. Like, I like what you're doing, but I don't have time to do the research. So they put them in touch with me. I said, I've done all kinds of research on these guys. Let me tell you why you should invest in this company. Generally, sometimes I say they shouldn't invest, but mostly. Um, and uh, we, we invest uh, in either debt, a debt instrument, or, or equity. It kind of depends. The debt instrument invariably always is a convertible debt. We are interested in becoming owners, not the owners, but partial owners of the companies that we invest in. The reason for that is we are, we want to get as much financial upside out of this as we can. Right now we get an appropriation from the state. Our long-term objective is to be completely independent of the state funding and be able to recycle our, our winnings 
back into the fund to be able to be a, kind of an evergreen type of type of organization. Um, so we call it a double bottom line fund. You know, we're trying to make money first and foremost. That's what I get out of bed in the morning to do. Um, but the knock on benefits of investing in great companies are that it will bring high quality jobs over the course of time to Virginia and really kind of meet the, what we're talking about today, which is the small businesses growing into big, healthy businesses that export and that hire people and things like that. Um, and then after we, we, so we have about 80 companies in our portfolio now. Um, we're adding about 20 a year uh, based on our current funding and, and staffing. And uh, we try to, w we stay very engaged with those companies. So it's, we don't write them a check and then walk away and say, you know, good luck. We, we have board observation roles in most cases and we help them along to the extent we're able to. Our help tends to take the form of fundraising, making introductions to venture capital firms and other angels that we, that we run around with. Um, and I just wanted, this is a busy slide, and uh, if, if any of you are interested, in, I can get you the statistics afterwards. But I thought it was interesting to just to look at the um, amount of pri private equity and sp specifically uh, venture capital and angel funding. As you can see, in Q3 uh, of this year, so the quarter just ended, there were over 5,000 um, companies that were invested in by um, angel, either super angels or venture capital um, in the U.S., and so a 12 percent increase over the prior quarter. So we're not, what this doesn't show is what's happened over the course of the last several years, and there have definitely been some ups and downs. But I think the, the intention here is to show that we're not in any kind of cyclical downturn. If anything, things are generally looking up, broadly speaking. Um, it is important to note that um, life sciences investing did not go up, uh, software is up, um, and clean technology, as you can see here, after several years of kind of bullishness, uh, but those companies not necessarily turning profits as quickly as they could or going public as quickly as they had, w folks had hoped um, that that level of investment activity is going down. Uh, but you can see, so a lot of ventures, you have the early stage investments and then you need to have exits. So the National Venture Capital Association um, announced, uh, again, about a week ago, the Q3 IPOs, 26 venture-backed um, IPOs raised 2.7, so an average about $100 million a piece. Um, and you always have the, the elephants that take the bulk of that. But um, And then probably, for me, just more, even more important is the number of venture-backed mergers and acquisition deals. So you can see a, a 5x multiple, 107 M&A um, deals were reported. And many of many more deals took place, M&A, and were not reported because they were small investments. Um, and then just to give you a sense of the health of the venture capital industry itself, which has not been particularly healthy over the last few years, um, 56, well, I have the notes right here, um, 56 U.S. venture capital funds raised $4.1 million. So um, that's relatively flat with but, but so you can see this, there's money coming into the industry, there's money being invested, and there's money being harvested. So it's a relatively healthy time now. There's no, there's no cliff immediately in front of us, but nor is it, you know, nor is it 1999 either, which was the last bull most bullish time I remember. So I'll leave my comments there for, for now. Thank you very much. <coughs> Please. Well, thank you very much, Ken, um, for inviting us. I'm going to give more of a perspective on, I'm going to wear two hats today, actually. The first one is with BIO, which is the um, Biotechnology Industry Organization. We are actually a nonprofit trade association. We have over 1,100 members, and um, most of those members are small biotech companies. We have academic institutions. We also have um, state um, biotech centers as well and service providers that are por part of our trade association. 90% of our membership, I would say, is small um, biotech businesses, um, well, companies, I would say. And we work in all different areas. So we do cures and treatments for devastating diseases. We work in the area of developing technologies for advanced biofuels, renewable um, chemicals, so in the clean tech space, we're there as well. And also, what's interesting is that we also have a division that of companies that work on novel um, gene traits for identifying food sources to combat global hunger. So um, biotechnology is, is 
I guess, the foundation of all different things that you could do that are in your life today. And when I first came to bio six years ago, I did not know that. I even, um, one day I was on the hill and they said, you see all these plastic forks here? They're actually made from bio-renewable um, materials. I was like, that's very interesting. I didn't even know that. So um, bio is a, a very interesting footprint. Our companies do amazing work. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on our health companies, just because in general, just as a snapshot to give you a little bit of background, is that it takes more than a decade and over a billion dollars to bring one single um, treatment to market. So for example, it starts in um, a university. They do research, there's tech transfer, you get some angel investors like Sean was mentioning. And what happens from there is you hope you will go to a VC round and then eventually either have an M&A deal with a big pharma or you go IPO or you take the company fully to commercialization. I, I think that's a trend that doesn't happen as much just because it takes so much to scale up to do that. Um, one of the things the acting SBA administrator and Giovanni had mentioned pre-revenue companies and a lot of IP-based knowledge. Most of these companies have probably three or four you know, therapies or products in the pipeline, but these small companies, their first um, therapy or product is based solely on external funding, whether it be friends and families, like Sean had mentioned, or it's um, through NIH grants or SBA grants, SBIR um, grants. What happens is that these companies lie, rely solely on external investors, and it's really, they don't have product revenue from another product to help them. So for these guys, capital is very, very important. Um, it takes a lot of money, as I just said, and but it's also a big market when they do go out there, so they do partner up. Um, just some um, antidotes, not antidotes, but more some facts that I pulled together from um, NVCA. They did a survey on what is happening in life sciences. In um, 2012, there was fewer than um, fewer first round venture financing deals than any year in the past decade. Um, the percentage of total biotech deals um, has um, been decreasing steadily. 41% of VC firms have decreased their investments in biopharmaceutical in the past three years, and 40% VCs have said they expected that it expects further decrease in the life science space. So it's definitely an issue, I think, um, where a lot of angel investors, friends and family, um, they've stepped into where VCs um, once were. It's just because the VC life sciences um, have not been investing, and it's because it's very high risk. And where I'm gonna turn to my second hat, um, I'm here also to talk on behalf of other um, innovative um, sectors, one being um, CIT, um, who is part of this coalition that um, came together that said, basically, in clean tech, nanotech, life sciences, really early stage types of small companies are still having problems. What we're seeing a, a trend um, in innovative IP-based type of um, industries is that the money's going to later stage because there's less risk there. But the early stage where you get your basic research that eventually springboard into later stage or commercial um, products, where they're still having problems getting that capital inflow. Um, we continue to be um, the leaders in you know basic research in the United States, but I think that's at risk. The coalition actually came together of 18 members that said, you know, if we were to look at different ways to get capital infused, um, for example, let's look at the tax code, and that's where my tax background comes in, we can try to figure out, well, what are things that could do to help leverage private investment into small companies? And what the coalition did to, um, of these 18 members from biotech to clean tech to high tech to nanotech came together to do was try to figure out what can be done in the current tax code. So the tax code has incentives currently, the R&D tax credit. That's something that doesn't help small companies that are pre-revenue. They don't make money right now. So what happens is the R&D credit gets carried on their books until they're profitable, which can offset their revenues. But in the meantime, you need that money to keep the lights on, get that research going. You can't, in science, you can't just turn off the lights and expect to start it up the next day. It just doesn't work that way. So um, the coalition came together, and this is very technical, I think, tax code sections. Um, what I just wanted to really say is that the coalition wants to come up, wants to be able to say to Hill staffers that if there is a possibility, whether it be um, in tax reform or any type of economic growth package, the coalition says recognize that small, innovative, early stage companies really need the tax code to gear towards them um, that could help leverage that private investment. So the first one is um, allowing 
partnership structures to get individual investors, such as, for example, angels, to be able to, on the upfront to get immediate um, tax benefits so that that helps minimize the immediate risk on the upside. The second proposal is more evaluation issue. Right now in the tax code, if you're a small company and you do, let's say, a, a angel, uh, not angel, a, 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 a VC round of financing or you go IPO, you trip these 382 NOL rules. So basically your losses that you've been accumulating for years, they, they're limited. You don't have them on your books anymore. So from a valuation standpoint, investors don't see that. That's part of the value of your company. And the third thing is um, reduced capital gains rate um, for small businesses. Currently, a lot of small companies can't take advantage. Well, investors of small companies in the IP space can't take advantage of it because they're not considered a small company. Their, um, their IP, and because they need so much capital, they trip over what a definition of a small business is under um, Section 1202. So the coalition has really come together and really trying to think of more, um, I guess, ideas or ways. Th this is what um, we've come up as a collective group. We're open to more suggestions of um, what are solutions uh, of for small companies. So I'm going to stop here and um, see if there's any questions. Ken? Thank you very much. This is one of the things. Before we go to the questions from the audience, I, as I listened to you all, in one way or another, you were all looking at the context for financing and in many cases emphasizing the series of gaps. I think, Giovanni, you started us down that path. Bob, you gave us a very nice macro view. Uh, Sean, you were saying, well, the boy, Maybe 3% of the people make it, even though some of them may look promising. And you have the same coalition now that's focused, again, on mm -hmm. how do you get more angels, let's say. The, mm -hmm. uh, I guess the devil is in the details, but the angels are in the small business. So the question really is, if you were to ask, if you were to pose three changes, and you have some tax ideas already, three mm -hmm. changes you'd like to see in federal policy that would foster a greater flow of resources to the small business entrepreneur? And maybe what three, three uh, changes in the corporate slash banking world that would, make, that would facilitate this as well? Anyone want to jump at this question? <coughs> One thing I'd like to say, and I'm not at all a tax expert, but um, in Virginia, we do have an angel tax credit program, which I don't think is taken advantage of as much as it should be, but something like that at the mm -hmm. federal level would be would be interesting as well. But again, I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Virginia is a model for the for the rest of the country or not. Well, I know Maryland. Um, Maryland's a big biotech center there. There's a biotech investment um, tax credit that a lot of investors take advantage of. We originally at this, the coalition did look at a federal angel tax credit, and um, we worked with the Angel Capital um, Association out in I believe Kansas and. It's hard from a tax policy standpoint, I've been doing this for a while, to go up and take the temperature of different members of uh, on the Hill and say, would you want one and what, how would you define what, what industries would get this? Because a lot of times when you look at a, 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 a angel tax credit, they actually list which industries. So you get all these different people that come to the table and you're like, I've been left out and you know, it's very hard to make up this list and include everyone. And then number two, what is the right percentage that the investor should get? So generous is 20%. I've seen that um, on the state level. But I believe there's over 21 state-level um, angel tax credits out there right now. It's probably a tough tough sell, too, in light of you know everyone's talking about simplification. And Correct. <laughs> more, more credits doesn't necessarily simplify. Right. And I think one thing I just want to point out, the three tax proposals that the coalition is looking at, they are not new tax credits or deductions. They are in line with simplification. That We kept that in mind of not creating a new tax credit nor new tax deduction. Do you want any thoughts? Well, certainly from the Chamber's point of view, we look at things in a broad perspective. Uh, we like market-based solutions. With that said, though, there are a number of gaps. Uh, we, we have to be cognizant of that. Uh, certainly, uh, the existing programs of, at, at SBA, we support a lot of those programs. Uh, the financing over years, you know, to, for whether it's traditional uh, small businesses or the uh, uh, fast-growing small businesses, which actually have their own uh, problems. I mean, a, a lot of people don't realize when you grow two, three, four hundred percent a year, uh, you can actually grow yourself into bankruptcy, and, and that's that's a very unique situation to be in. To be so successful that you can't pay the bills. Um, 
but but at the chamber, I, I, I think from a policy standpoint, we sit back and, and try to look at broad perspectives. I know uh, if you were to ask me to, for some changes, certainly the, the tax code is a little bit problematic in the sense that uh, uh, we, we, our members are all over the place. Um, but I think from the SBA perspective, I think we support a lot of uh, their initiatives, uh, especially SBIC very important uh, when you go from angel investing to uh, uh, to that venture capital. The venture capitalists, as you well said, uh, they want to eliminate a lot of risk. And your angels at a certain point want to get out. And there's that huge gap. Uh, not only do small businesses in that world need funding, but they need mentorship. Because remember, that small business minds, that, that's the guy that came into the office with the baseball cap turn backwards, and the next thing you know, he's running a company with 500 employees if he's successful. He needs the mentoring as well uh, as the money. So I think if, if there's one thing I would say is we need to couple the mentoring along with it. Yeah. Well, the one thing I'd like to add too, and um, it's, uh, it's yet to play itself out completely, but it's, I think it's an important evolution in the, in the funding opportunities is the, the crowdfunding uh, component of, of the Jobs Act. Um, it's still, you know, it's th the kinks are still being worked out and will be for some time. But I think the, you know, so historically, for those of you who don't know, you need to have been an accredited investor to invest in essentially any business, right? There was always a little bit of exclusion, like when, you're, when your kids started a company, you could give them some money to get started kind of thing. But, but once you had any scale at all, you had, you know, um, you had this requirement. So with the JOBS Act, and in particular with the, the crowdfunding component, um, they're basically taking away the requirement that you be an accredited investor up to a certain level of investment. So what that's going to do, it's, we, we don't think it's going to impact kind of the, that small percentage of companies that are on the, kind of on the venture trajectory, but we think it's going to have a big impact potentially on everyone else, right? So you want to open up a, a retail store, you know, grandma's apple pie, and you need capital. You need to, you know, get get, uh, you know, get a lease and things like that. And as a 19-year-old, you don't have access to that stuff. Or at least, you know, if you, if you got one credit card, you've got a $2,500 credit limit on it. So not a lot. So anyway, it opens up a huge opportunity for kind of officially sanctioning the friends and family component of of uh, an early stage funding opportunity. So I think that's to be encouraged. Well, the, the Congressional Research Service is not allowed by statute to make policy recommendations, but we are allowed to talk about the consequences of the options before the Congress. <laughs> and we are allowed to talk about recommendations made by other federal agencies. So I'm just going to uh, mention uh, one recommendation that came from the General uh, GAO, Government Accountability Office, uh, and then mention two other things in passing which I think helps us understand to how we evaluate uh, the SBA as an agency that I think would be helpful for the discussion. First, GAO has come out in several reports and indicated that it would be nice if the SBA had, uh, in addition to its output measures, uh, performance measures. What I mean by that is not just the lending volume or the liquidation rate or the loss rates and, and those kinds of statistics about how busy we are and, uh, and therefore if it's more this year than last year, we're doing better more about the qualitative nature of the impact of that lending or venture capital investment in terms of job creation, wealth generation, uh, and uh, re re retention of employees, people going from part-time to full-time, and whether or not the business is still in existence five or ten years ago, and then do they come back and say, boy, that was a great thing you made. You see, I'm suggesting a little bit more heavy uh, into the analysis of the impact of the programs uh, that is problematic from the SBA's perspective because they have moved out of the direct lending. In 1995, they stopped doing direct lending to businesses and moved to this model of uh, the guarantees, and now there, there's a distance between that, so it's a little bit more difficult. But they do an excellent job of doing performance measurements for their entrepreneurial development programs. They hire outside firms every year to do surveys of clients. Uh, so one of the recommendations of GAO is perhaps they can do that with uh, folks that have received uh, 7A, 504, microloaned, et cetera, uh, to give. Uh. The other two things I'd like to mention quickly is, uh, one, in evaluations of the SBA, because there, there are a lot of criticisms of the SBA. It's not like everything's wonderful. Uh, 
Um, one of the things I like to mention to staff and to members is that we have to remember we're asking the SBA to do something that the private marketplace would not do itself. Mm -hmm. There's a credit elsewhere requirement. The lender has to say, I would not give this loan if it weren't for a guarantee. So right away, it's more risky to begin with. Um, and uh, even in the venture capital program, even though it's more or less hands off, they have, uh, you know, after the participating securities problem in 2000, 2001, when over $2 billion was lost, um, the SBA put in a lot of safeguards that have made the SBIC program, uh, it's never lost money since. Um, but there's that question about how do you get at that angel marketplace. But my point is, is that the reason why the SBA was asked to go there in the first place is nobody else would do it. So when you evaluate the SBA, uh, you have to take that into consideration, I believe, in terms of uh, doing a fair assessment of their effectiveness as an agency. And the third thing is a lot of people forget that the SBA's m role uh, is only secondarily job creation. Its primary role from the very beginning of the institution was to prevent the forma formation of oligarchies and monopolies in each of the various industries, which helps to explain why they have 1,148 size standards, one for each industry, uh, trying to uh, gauge, you know, uh, to pr promote competition in each of those industries. The idea was is if you can prevent oligarchy and monopoly formation, that in the long term would create jobs. And it got them out of that problem of trying to target just those industries uh, that are in the realm of creating jobs. So for example, the mom and pop who wants to come in and they've got a pizza store and they want to have nine employees instead of eight, they get the same consideration as somebody who walks in and says, I'm interested in being the next Apple. Uh, and that's part of the SBA mission. It's part of why it was created in the first place. That doesn't mean that job creation isn't important. The very first hearing, because I have a search engine that shows all the congressional hearings back to the beginning of time. <laughs> the very first hearing with the, actually, I, I thought it was the first SBA administrator, but apparently the first one, there was a problem and he quit. Uh, so the second intro, but it was the first hearing I could find, uh, like the second paragraph was, uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, part of our job is to help with job creation. But then he went about, but our bigger job is to deal with, you know, pr pr promoting competitive markets. So I think we have to understand in evaluating and looking at these programs that they are going to be these gaps is what the, the SBA is all about trying to fill. And it's not an easy job. If it was, somebody else would be doing it. And that's the, pr that's the issue that Congress struggles with every day. They know it's risky business to begin with. How can we r minimize that risk to maximize the return from the taxpayer? And that's the challenge of SBA, and that's Congress's challenge and oversight of the administration. Well, let's turn to the audience for some of your penetrating questions. We already had reference to Das Kapital. Maybe we'll <laughs> have some references to Schumpeter, the gentleman there. Uh, yes, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Malan brought up the crowdfunding piece because basically I went to a symposium about a month ago regarding that. And it really works. Uh, it's one of those situations where if you, you have to build your crowd before you actually put your information out there. And there are companies that will charge about $200 a month. But if you use technology, you do your LinkedIn, you contact everybody on Facebook and let them know, hey, I have a great outstanding thing going here. I want your support. Then you do your, your, you do your crowd presentation uh, online. Uh, of course, prior to that, you, you, you market. You can use uh, their marketing tools on LinkedIn and Facebook, um, even on Google. And you can get a substantial amount of money to support your, your startup or your existing business. So that's an awesome, especially part of the Jobs Act. It's not just for for-profit companies, but it's really great for nonprofits. That uh, way you don't have to pay the money back. You know, it's, it's basically, this is what I'm planning to do. I have a 501c3. Please give me some support. So that's an awesome, uh, I was waiting for that to come out. I might have missed it, I had to pee the meter, but I was like, wow, this is, the crowdfunding is, is one of the, the gaps, that it, one, of the, one of those elements that closes the gap. Uh, another thing that I noticed, being a former banker, is that you know, banks will lend up to 10% of your gross revenue. Uh, and basically, so if you got $3 million in gross revenue, up to 300,000 in a loan or a line of credit, and they cherry pick. So if you only go for the big banks, more than likely uh, they can take up to 30 days to tell you no. Most people who go for loans or lines of credit, they, they, don't, they, they need the money now. They wait until the last minute, number one, and then they don't want to wait 30 days for you to say no for them to start the process over again. Hence, you've got local banks that don't do a lot of advertising. For example, there's one called Capital Bank out in Bethesda. They only have three locations. They actually lend to startups. And they have a panel of people. They don't go to a 
They don't, they don't have to deal with stockholders. They have a panel of people who sit and determine who gets the loan or who gets the line, usually within about two weeks. So th there are options, but you know, the people have to do a lot of research to find these little banks that actually lend to, and they're all over the place in Virginia and DC. There are small local banks that will fill that gap as well. Thank you. That was a very interesting comment. Any comments from the panel? Or let me go to the next question. Gentleman just. Uh, Jim Sank, I, I actually have two detailed questions. One for Mr. Dilger. The right side of the panel talked about specific sectors, biotech, uh, clean energy, and the like. And your figures, uh, you showed macro figures on outstanding small business loans and uh, commercial banks for, commer for commercial and industrial loans. Uh, to what extent can those be uh, disaggregated into particular sectors so one can get a better view of how things are going? In that level places? is not available. It's one of the, the, the methodological challenges that we face because we, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that they vary significantly. Uh, mm -hmm. Construction firms have indicated they've had a lot of problems. Yeah. Okay. And the second question related, actually, it's more as small businesses grow. Um, small businesses are all very, always very innovative. As they grow, there's a school of thought that says that uh, as they grow and if they're forced to go public or go become part of public companies, they become less innovative than if they stay private, but that the system forces them to either go public or join, be bought up by a public company. So how does that system uh, do you guys have any thoughts about how, whether we are um, biting ourselves in the rear end, so to speak, in the way we fund things and draw and you get know, out? I, I don't. I don't really see it as a um, as, as being correlated. The, the the lack of innovation or the trend towards less innovation, it not so much correlated with funding events, whether it be an IPO or or getting bought out um, as much. Getting brought out is a little bit different, but but an IPO I think is should be considered as a funding event. I think what, in my experience, what makes companies less innovative is when they just they start to, you know, they over over um, proceduralize everything, right? I mean, one of the one of the, you know, people still talk about Google as being this amazingly entrepreneurial place inside that you have an individual group where a team has a project to do and no one gets in their way. Right? They just go about doing it. And I'm sure it's not quite as clean as that. But So I think there are companies that are able to maintain their innovative nature, uh, even as they grow to be very large. And then others that hit a point when they're not very large and they start to, to stagnate. You know, I, I would attribute it mostly to leadership rather than, than organizational. Wouldn't a private company where the founder was still running it work? Give it, wouldn't the company where the founder was still running but were private have more freedom, in fact, than... Uh well, uh, you know, I, I was talking to, to a, a fellow investor last night who had uh, backed a company several years ago, and the, the founding CEO um, had gotten to a point where he just kind of lost steam, right? He, he'd grown the company to a certain point, and the board members and investors around the table basically came to him and said, you know, you hired this great number two person, we think this number two guy would actually, you know, seems to have the, the gumption to take this thing forward. So it was a very, it was a very well organized and very well orchestrated. No bad blood. The the founding CEO stepped aside, still owned plenty of shares. Was made was going to make plenty of money, but basically gave it to someone, gave the reins to someone that had more energy. And this happened a year ago, and the company is was quite large already. They've doubled profitability in the last in the last 12 months. So things like that, you can almost reverse the stagnation too with the right leadership, I would argue. Sean, I want to build on that point. Uh, I, I think it's a misconception among a lot of business owners that they have to maintain control, maintain ownership. And this domination of the business, it becomes at a certain point an obstruction to them growing, uh, especially when it comes to access to capital. I think a lot of uh, businesses or a lot of business owners, when they 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 go into their startup, they 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 become such such they have such pride in in, in their their business that they can't s let loose of the reins. And I think in order to do that, they or in order to grow, they have to. And it's an evolving process. Now I can give you a number of examples uh, of, of small businesses that have come to a point where they've cashed out. They've let other entrepreneurial efforts into the business and still maintain their entrepreneurial 
thought process or fostered other divisions within the company to be entrepreneurial. And at a certain point, you have to evolve as a owner of a company beyond just maintaining control. If you're using a lot of energy and a lot of resources to maintain control, you can really lose, uh, lose the vision of uh, growing and, and, and evolving to a larger group. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is the Kauffman Foundation, which is involved in today's presentations, uh, has done some innovative work uh, following the life of uh, a large panel of, of businesses over time. And they've also done a lot of analysis on job creation amongst businesses, and it's somewhat related to this. What it found out was a lot of larger firms were growing, not necessarily because they were growing themselves, but they were purchasing small businesses. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting potential places for a lot of research is, is that how large businesses are becoming, quote, unquote, more innovative, not in-house, but by recognizing somebody else is becoming doing something interesting that could potentially be a threat or an asset, uh, and they go out and they buy it because they have an established market, they have an established product, they have established procedures, but they're trying to be innovative without messing up that dynamic, and so outside. Um, I've not read a whole lot of economic research looking at this issue specifically, but I think that's about the closest one, which gives you a sense that different firms have different uh, strategies, if you will, dealing with how it positions itself for the future. Uh, and large firms, particularly ones sitting on cash, as many of them are now, are out hunting. Um, and so it's, it makes it more difficult for us trying to figure out what's going on with the small business environment because a lot of the small businesses are having tr trouble getting capital suddenly are bought by somebody and they're not a small business anymore. And then how do you, how do you count them in terms of all the metrics? Um, but it's one thing that the Kauffman Foundation has clearly demonstrated is that the uh, capital marketplace Capitalism in America is uh, churning continuously. It, it never pauses, um, and it's very dynamic. And I suspect this whole innovation thing is all part of that process <laughs> of uh, how do you position yourself for survival and expansion. Uh, but I found it fascinating when I read about the job creation thing that a lot of the job creation that's being reported that we see right now, see, small businesses have been outperforming large businesses up to the last couple quarters for quite a while. Last two quarters, large businesses are starting to take off and the small businesses are lagging behind for some reason. Can't quite figure out why, but that's what the data is telling us. Um, and I'm wondering if it, what's happening is, is that the larger businesses are kind of getting a little more comfortable and starting to buy up. So we're gonna, I'm going to take a look at what the data says about what's going on with purchases. But I think it has a lot to do with the old innovation question, generally speaking. We have a question of the gentleman in the back there. We spoke a lot about innovation, and, and I'm trying to sit outside and, and ask myself, if I am a VC or I am an angel, and you present um, the things that we talked about as an investment opportunity, would I risk my money um, and invest in all the things that, that we just talked about? Um, and my point is, I think that innovation uh, policy should also be innovative, and I'm trying to find out to myself um, what innovation are there in the field of investing, of growing small businesses um, <laughs> that, that we haven't spotted. Um, and I, I'm not sure that we have answers on what would be um, 10 years time from now, what will be the key things that will drive small businesses and where government can intervene. Three things that I've heard about in the last um, a few months might be interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure they, these are the innovative solutions. Shared space, for instance, WeWork, things like that. Um, government can interfere and can uh, fund some of these initiatives because a young entrepreneur, you know, he, he doesn't need a lot of things. He can um, uh, make a partner that will develop the technology, but he doesn't have lawyer, he doesn't have designer, um, and he doesn't have space uh, to work from. And these things can be done um, through government. Credits for angels, you, you mentioned that, and I think this is something really interesting. Um, and you talked before about um, encouragement uh, for big companies to buy small companies. This might also be a direction of innovation um, in, in government intervention. What I'm saying is um, we might um, think uh, or look for Russia or look in China for innovative solutions on how to encourage innovation. Okay, thoughts about looking around the world? And then I do have a... We're r close to running out of time, but I have a couple of questions. I want to go back to, to Giovanni. Okay. Well, I'll yeah. be real brief. The SBA has programs along these lines, but we have to remember the SBA is a fairly small actor in all of this. 
Um, universities have been doing this for a long time. I was at West Virginia University for almost 15 years as an administrator and a professor, and we have a business park where we have shared space, the exact model that you're talking about. Uh, and the SBA has programs to encourage this, growth accelerators and that sort of thing, merging leaders and changes name several times, but basically it's about this kind of stuff, is uh, clusters. And, uh, but we have to remember the SBA is only, even if you look at its so-called $90 billion portfolio, that's still overall in terms of total venture capital, maybe 5 or 6% of the whole marketplace mm -hmm. uh, for lending in, in the United States if you count venture capital and all the sources. So the SBA is, is, is an important actor. Uh, because it's trying to supplement what the private sector is doing, uh, but it clearly is a, a relatively small factor. It's an important one, particularly to the people who receive it. Um, you know, it's very important to their businesses, and I don't mean to minimize that. But we have to recognize, if we're looking at big major changes of the economy, uh, the SBA is involved. It's a player. It's an actor, but the private sector is much larger. Uh, universities are getting involved in this. They see this as a natural outreach for their uh, schools of business and economics uh, and also for their um, students. Uh, small business development centers uh, that the SBA supports are into this as well. Um, the big problem has always been, uh, the reason why we lost all that money in participating securities is it targeted that particular area, the so-called valley of death, uh, and they invested heavily in technology and we had to burst. That, and they have an early stage small business in initiative going on right now that is, uh, um, I have to be careful the word that I use, uh, it's just getting going and it's, it's, it's probably not doing as much as the SBA would like and they're trying to figure out how to make it grow. Um, I think that's the polite way to say it. And um, they're trying, the point is, but um, they're not having a lot of success. I think that's the key. If we can come up with an innovative, and of course we'd all be rich if we knew, um, but I think the, the, the key source for venture capital has always been, you know, as you mentioned, most venture capitalists give, what, 2 3% of the people? I mean, people are asking for the resources. But venture capitalists, they have to be, you know, they have their own investments. They want to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very difficult to, to figure out what, what the next Facebook is versus some other entity that's going to fail. And keep in mind, over half of all small businesses fail in the five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a risky marketplace. Um, Personally, I mean, we're not allowed to do policy recommendations, but, you know, an ob observation is I think the venture capital folks are critical to the economic success of the United States, and the decisions that they make are critical uh, to job development and growth in the United States. And it's outside of the realm of direct government, although the SBA has a venture capital program, but it's relatively small compared to everybody else. Uh, but like the folks sitting at the end of this table, um, I'm absolutely fascinated by what they do and their importance to our economy and how people don't recognize their importance to the economy. They are critical. And, um, you know, Kauffman Foundation has pointed out a lot, um, real estate evaluations have been a real drag because a lot of people use their house as collateral and a lot of people uh, have, have borrowed against their house on, on time loans and credit cards and that sort of thing. And hopefully, if that comes back, that'll be a big boost. And it's something we don't normally think about. You know, the housing market, we're all worried about people being reversed. I was worried about that as well, but I was also worried about how that's going to affect small business lending and small businessmen who are looking to their parents and to their home and their investments, um, you know, to get going. So I think another close thing to watch is what's going on with housing valuation, uh, a surprising link between housing valuations and small business lending that's going on. One of the things, too, I'd, I'd like to say, I think that the, the free market, if you will, has done an excellent job in this country um, from like really early stage innovation. You can't go to a town that has, you know, any town of 50,000, population of 50,000 or more has some form of accelerator, incubator funded by the local municipality that says, you know what, we want to keep our young people here and things like that. So, you know, it's great to do things at the federal level, but at the end of the day, what happens on the ground in these localities is where all of these things start, right? You need to have the support of the local attorneys and the local business leaders that, that can be your mentors, that can teach you how to do things and can write a $10,000 check to get you going or whatever it is. And so there's a tremendous amount that I don't think anyone should ever try to control or try to manage just to say, you know, there's a demand and there's a supply for all these different services. Let it happen. Make sure that there's there's the flow through, right? As people do kind of hit that that early traction, that they have the next you know handholds to go to. But at the 
you know, so I, I would say don't mess with the don't mess from a policy standpoint other than don't try to add anything to it you know and don't take anything away <laughs> well, I'm going to raise this question of adding something to it um, you mentioned the shrinking number of banks particularly it sounded like a lot of community banks didn't survive this latest crisis so just as we saw Mr. Smith go to Washington at some point Mr. Smith was making a loan and he knew Giovanni had confidence that he would pay him back. How do we, is there anything that we can or should do to stimulate the resurrection of some of these community character-based lending banks? And, and that's a very good question. In today's regulatory community, uh, we, have, we hear from a lot of community banks in which they say that the regulations, even though they're meant not to filter down to the small community banks, uh, the regulators are doing that. And, and this is something that I, I, I don't see a real problem now, but the trend seems to be going toward eliminating the numbers of banks because of the uh, size. Uh, you know, if you're a larger bank, you can deal with regulations a lot better. Uh, and I'm not trying to give a qualitative statement on whether or not banks need to be regulated as heavily as they do. Uh, we have our own op opinions on that. But uh, certainly, uh, small community banks uh, tend to be a lot more friendlier to that person across the street. Uh, They're able to use the, their character in order to promote growth and, uh, and lending. And, and I'm not quite sure what type of policy statement we want, other than trying to uh, insulate smaller banks from a lot of the regulatory process. Uh, you know, banking institutions are the same as anyone else. They're businesses as well. And they should be allowed to fail at some point. And uh, as long as you can uh, protect investors to a degree. And, and, but, but there should be regulations. And, and I'm not quite sure where you draw the line. They're, they're, they should be allowed to take risks. And at what point are those risks extraordinary? I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we. But, but it really deserves discussion because I think small businesses can be impacted if we look five or ten years down the road and they disappear. Uh, is there another private sector um, source of funds that will, maybe it's crowdfunding, maybe it's something else that will come in to take the place. But certainly if we end up with um, 20 or 30 big banks and that's, that's all we're dealing with, I think it's going to be a a tough time, even though those big banks are members of the chamber and they're very good. Uh, we're not saying anything against them. I, I, I think it's going to be very difficult. Son, you emphasize mentoring as something that you did and that was so important. Um, I ran into a, uh, an example at MIT where they had a very systematic mentoring program and other institutions began to contact them. Is there something that one could do to promote that sort of mentoring around the country. I mean, it spread naturally, but maybe one could accelerate the spread. Yeah, it's, it's I would say over the last three or four years, it's been, it's been like a, a wildfire in terms of, you know, these, these, it, it's really generally has been done around these accelerator and incubator mm -hmm. type programs, right? Where you get a bunch of mentor type people in the community say, raise your hand, say, I'd love to help out. I don't need to be compensated. I just, you know, I've got a little extra money. Maybe from time to time, I'll, I'll make an angel investment. But I really just want to kind of help these millennials out, or you know, these new people kind of coming up through. So I don't know if there's a. Um, I, I don't know that there's anything that you could do or sing or chant or whatever that would cause it to you happen know, more. But Washington summit and mentors and give it national yeah. attention or and, and something else. Certainly, the, uh, the the national angel organization, you know, that's a big piece of their platform as well, is, is really being an, an angel investor, I think, sees themselves appropriately, it should, right, is it's more about the, it's more about the men mentor ca component than the money capability, mm -hmm. right? Well, the money's important to you because you got to pay some bills, but you got to get a business going first. Um, the, the federal government has a fairly robust mentoring program dealing with contracting. Uh, most of the federal agencies have a mentor protege program where uh, larger businesses partner with smaller businesses uh, both in, a pl in uh, seeking grants and in uh, getting credits, larger business getting credits towards their bids 
if they have a protege that they're helping dealing with the contracting program. Uh, there's also, in terms of access to capital, the SCORE program, uh, which are retired executives, uh, which is sponsored by the SBA, uh, is, is, is fairly large uh, and, and does a, uh, you know, is part of the portfolio of tools in the chest, if you will, for uh, SBA to help small businesses. But the key for me has always been the role of the local chambers of commerces and rotaries uh, in connecting uh, businesses with folks of capital, uh, the local bankers. Um, there's only so much that the federal government can do. Um, Congress, for example, has mandated that the SBA start uh, a uh, mentor protege program for all small businesses. Right now it's based on, you know, they have one for 8A programs and each of the federal agencies. So there'll be more mentor protege programs, but they're primarily targeted at contracting opportunities. What I don't know a lot about, and it'd be interesting to find out if there's academic work on it, is the extent to which states are doing this and to the extent which places like the Chamber, uh, National Association of Manufacturers and other groups might encourage the states to emulate what the federal government is doing uh, in a sense of trying to do this mentorship. Uh, that's probably a proper role for government and one that would be a, uh, get support from both sides of the aisle. Well, where you do see a fair amount of that is in the local economic development organizations that towns have and regions have and things like that. So they get case of Virginia, they get some funding from Richmond that flows out and it supports a staff of, you know, one to three people in any given area. And, they're, and they do make introductions to the, the regional banks and they sit down and say, well, what are your, you know, this space is too small for you now, what are you looking for? Let me see if I can make a few phone calls. So it's more business facilitation than, than a strict right. mentoring. But that's, but at a certain level, that's you know, it's a resource. It's an it's a resource you don't have to pay for directly. You know, and they're they're compensated based on who they can bring into sure. that locality and things. So I, I think it does happen, mm -hmm. at least in my experience in Virginia, quite relatively effectively. And I don't know. I'm not convinced that it would happen very well at the at purely at the state level, right? Because all of these things really are. It goes back to your local banking relationships, right? It's you don't invest in someone that you don't know. Yeah, I was thinking more in terms of grants to facilitate it and that kind of thing. Yeah. Recognizing that there's an economic benefit to it and it's, uh, it has a targeted resource that appeals to both sides of the aisle, if you get a sense of what I'm saying. I realize that we have reached our, our uh, witching hour. I promised everyone to wind this up, including the panel, all of whom have other commitments and responsibilities. So would you please join me in a round of applause for really <laughs> penetrating an outstanding panel.